Rockin' Larry Lockin' with Pleiadian Talk, wherever you are in this now moment, never-ending now moment, anywhere in the galaxy, space, time, the cosmos. Tonight we have got a really, really, really great show for you. My guest at this current now moment in time is a gentleman I consider both a mentor and a legend, as well as somebody I've looked up to for nearly five years before actually having the pleasure to speak with him and do some work for his great organization. His love and faith for humanity motivates him to work relentlessly in humanity's best interest, 12 to 15 hours a day, 365 days a year. We'd like to ask that you please like and follow um, N5D as well as Body, Mind, Soul, Spirit on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd like to welcome the founder, owner, radio editor, and web maestro of N5D, Esoteric Metaphysical and Spiritual Database, as well as Mind, Body, Soul, Spirit.com, the great Greg Prescott, coming to us from <laughs> Florida, outside of his N5D studios. Greg, how's it going, man, and how's the weather down there? Well, it's beautiful. You know, I went to the beach earlier today, and uh, it's probably low 80s, and uh, sunny, gorgeous, you know, the 99% Quartz crystal sand is amazing. So if you ever have the opportunity to come to Sarasota, you got to check out the beach. Likewise, coming to you from the other end of the country, overlooking the Pacific Ocean here in Coos Bay, Oregon. It's probably about 75 degrees, clear skies, not as warm as where you're at, but uh, we've been blessed with the same kind of weather. Yeah. I'm, I'm really honored to have you here on the show, and I, you know, I thought to start off with, I'd like to kind of take you back a little bit before we get into what motivated you to create N5D and all the great um, pages and websites that you've created, as well as a great radio show on N5D. What, um, what was your mindset growing up? Did you, what, what was life like for Greg Prescott, say, growing up in the 70s and the 80s, things of that nature? What, where was your mind at then, and you know, what, what interests you back then? Well, I can actually go back to the 60s. I turned 56 <laughs> this year. So uh, the 60s, um, for me, my parents are religious. They're, they're Christians, and uh, I used to have to go to Sunday school uh, every Sunday, obviously. And uh, as soon as I walked into the church, I would get the eebie-jeebies. And I know there's other people out there that get that same feeling. Um, it's just something doesn't feel right when you walk into the church and uh, I got that feeling every time and I, in Sunday school my teacher I would confront about you know questions uh, our origins of the origins of mankind I would ask her all these questions and I would question everything she said even at such a young age here I am like three four five years old questioning my teacher and it got to the point where they had to you know basically say stop questioning everything or else I would have gotten kicked out of Sunday school. <laughs> but uh, it's funny because that all ties back into a past life I had. I, I, I can remember three past lives. Two were in, and two were in Atlantis, and uh, one I was a Mayan elder during the Spanish Inquisition, and uh, they threatened to kill me if I didn't convert over to Christianity, and. Uh, I agreed to do it, but I, I lied to them because I wanted to pass on my knowledge to the children. So um, I think that's part of my um, cellular memory and disdain for organized religion. Not that, you know, there's good things that do come out of religion. It tells a wonderful story of astro theology and all, has good morals, but it's like my mom would say, she'd say, our church does a lot of good things for the community. I said, why do you have to have a church to do good, to do good things for other people, you know? <laughs> but, you know, at a young age, that, that, was, that was it. And, you know, and then around 11, 12 years old, I saw in the back of a magazine this ad for, it was basically a book on black magic, but it, there was a chapter in there that caught my eye. It was on, it was on astral projection. I thought, how cool would that be? So I saved my money up, and I put the cash in an envelope, <laughs> mailed it out, and uh, a few weeks later, in the summertime, while my parents were at work, I got the book, and I started trying to learn astral projection at a, at a young age, and I never got to it at that point, but uh, it was, it, I've always known, I've always had this interest in metaphysics, and, you know, stuff beyond what we can perceive with our five senses, so... You know, at a young age, I started getting into this stuff, and of course, you know, as I got older, you know, you you move away from that stuff a little, and uh, you know, I 
joined a fraternity in college. And that was a blessing, too, because uh, the frat I was in, I'm not going to mention the name, but uh, our fraternity prayer is almost identical to the Freemason prayer. Almighty God, the great architect of the universe, the giver of all good gifts and graces, thou hast promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou will be in thy midst and bless them, yada, 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 109 words long. And uh, so, I, matter of fact, we even have a traditional called Pike's Peak, named after Albert Pike. So even joining a fraternity, um, I, I, I learned to understand how this whole, how it's all built up. You know, you start at the bottom, you get these, you know, you create a party-like atmosphere, and that's what a fraternity is, one big party. And uh, you create this party-like atmosphere, and you bring people in from that, but as we've learned, at the top of Freemasonry, they worship the Luciferian Bible, even though they have the Christian Bible in the middle of their floor when you walk in. At the highest level of Freemasonry, they worship they worship the Luciferian doctrine. So uh, it was a blessing that I did get into the uh, fraternity that I, I got into and uh, learned a little about the inner workings of Freemasonry. So that carries me up until my uh, late teens right there. <laughs> That's interesting. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's got the heebie-jeebies going into church, too. And I really feel like it's the only place where I've ever seen a demon before, like in the background when the preacher's <laughs> preaching, and I'm baptized and all that, too, you know, and it just, the environment is just kind of so phony. I mean, you know, you're, these people are religious on Sunday morning, and some of them on Wednesday night, and, you know, then they go back to their mundane, you know, nine-to-five lives, and I think that's interesting, the story you told about getting that book. I bet you were kind of sweating that your parents would get that in the mail, right? You were hoping that you, 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 were hoping that you would get that. Yeah, I, I, can, I can totally relate to that. I mean, did yeah. you, were you interested in, you know, 3D things like sports or anything like that too, yeah, yeah. growing up? In the yeah, I was a huge sports fanatic. Um, I have a photographic memory when it comes to looking at statistics in sports. I could look at the uh, sports page and tell you who's fifth in the American League in doubles, who's seventh in the National League in ERA, and what the ER, what their ERA is, and whatever the st the uh, statistic is. I love numbers and statistics, um, and I played a lot of sports. Um, my parents wouldn't allow me to play football in high school, but in retrospect, my father recently told me he said, "You know what? I wish I let you play." And I'm like, "I wanted to play the whole time." But yeah, I ended up lettering in track. I used to pole vault in track. I'm too slow to run anything, <laughs> but I can pole vault. And uh, I also lettered in bowling, and I've had a couple sanctioned 300s in leagues, and uh, it's it's fun. You know, it's just a hobby now. I, I still bowl occasionally, but it's just fun. Love sports, though. Yeah, I, I like to bowl, too, but I'm not... I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that it sounded like you were describing my life growing up because I really, really enjoyed, um, I have a photographic memory too, you know, the stats, who, who's leading the home run right player up to who's fifth, the RBIs, things of that nature, NBA, NFL, and I could tell you, like, who won every the championship in every sport going back clear 20 years beforehand. So I just really immersed myself in that. But then when I had my awakening, I really wasn't so into it so much anymore, although I still follow it kind of at a, you know, bird's eye distance, but when you awaken, those things kind of just don't matter to you as much anymore. Um, I, I, I know that at one point, I don't know, when we were talking on another show, we were, the subject of 9-11 had came up, and, you know, it sounded like at the beginning of 9-11, you were wondering what was going, were you, were you, did you have any thoughts about extraterrestrials at that time yet, or anything oh, in the okay. metaphysical world? Well, um, I guess yeah. that's been that's one thing I left out about my early uh, teens, also late teens, actually. Um, one time we were, ha I, I'm from upstate New York, and uh, we were in the Catskill Mountains, and we were on top of this one mountain that overlooks Franklin Mountain. It's called On Top of the World, and we were having a keg party there. And the keg was there, and there was like seven or eight of us, and we were waiting for the person that had the tap to bring it up. And we're just standing around shooting the shit, and... Uh, over the other mountain that it looks towards, towards Franklin Mountain, these three UFOs came up in formation, hovered, and then took off. 
and there was seven or eight of us there that saw it, and that was my first UFO that I saw, and there was multiple witnesses for it, um, and it was very impressive, and, and they were really low too, so you, you couldn't miss them. So, uh, and since then, I've I've gotten uh, several different um, night vision goggles. I have a good pair of uh, Generation Three night vision goggles, where, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> basically you can't go ten minutes without seeing a UFO. So. No, it's fascinating. I mean, with the right equipment, you can you can see it just in in the night skies, pretty much anywhere you are. Especially, it seems to me like there's a lot of activity. You know, if you're living in a coastal area, of course, that's, that could be true for the Midwest, too. But, yeah, they're just all over the place. And what they are and where they're from, I mean, we can all speculate. You know, some of them might be government crafts. A lot of them are definitely extraterrestrials, in my opinion. Actually, I, I pretty much know that for a fact. But um, I wanted you to kind of touch on, too, like a couple of things. One, what do your parents and what or what do they or what did they think of your awakening slash transformation, and what career field did you go into after you got out of college? If you could talk about that a little bit, those two things. Okay, well, my parents put me through college three times. I went, partied my ass off, flunked out. Well, I joined the frat, partied my ass off, flunked out, got reinstated, went back to the frat, partied my ass off, flunked out, got reinstated one more time, partied my ass off, and flunked out. And, uh, in my 20s, um, I was basically uh, playing lead and rhythm guitar in several hard rock bands. Uh, so my 20s were <laughs> a lot of fun, <laughs> to put it mild, mildly. But um, uh. yeah, and, and then I met my ex-wife, Amy, and uh, we ended up getting married. And she ended up giving me my only child, Brittany. And Brittany's everything, and I'll be talking a lot about her, but um, once Amy was pregnant, I, 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 I told her, I said, you know, I'd love to go back to college, but, and we just kept going back and forth on the logistics of being able to afford it or not. Well, subsequently afterwards, we ended up getting divorced uh, when Brittany was nine months old. And I, I did. I went back when I, when I was on my own. I went back to college, and I paid for it myself. Um, I graduated with honors for both my BA in psychology and subsequent master's degree, and I uh, ended up becoming a child and family therapist, uh, working with at-risk youth. And uh, I loved doing that. But you know, here in Florida, there's a saying: they pay you in sunshine. Uh, you know, that's what they said. You know, as a master's level therapist, I was making twenty-eight thousand dollars a year, and uh, it's 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 hard to get by on such a income when you have student loans and you have bills and everything else. It's it's tough. Um, but I ended up uh, through Amy. I went to her house one time to uh, pick up Brittany. We had joint custody, and. Uh, it was split right down the middle. I had Brittany Mondays, Wednesdays, and every other weekend. Amy had her Tuesdays, Thursdays, and every other weekend. And whoever had her on Friday, whoever whoever had her for the weekend, got her on Friday as well. So it was right down the middle. And uh, so I went there to pick up Brittany one time, and uh, she wasn't ready. She was getting ready. And uh, Amy told me, "Have you ever seen the trailer to The Secret?" And this is when it first came out. I'm like, "No." So uh, she's like, oh, come on in, check it out. So I did, and it blew me away so much that by the time Brittany and I got back to my house, <clears throat> I ordered it, and it came within the next few days, and I watched it, and it blew my mind. Now, at the time, I was married to my second wife, Jody, and uh, I was so excited about the secret, and I'm trying to tell Jody about it, and she's like, you know, she didn't, she didn't want to see it because her mother had read the book, and her mother's a devout Christian, you know, Southern woman. And uh, she read the book and she said, oh, that's a bunch of New Age mumbo-jumbo and you don't need to be involved in that kind of stuff. And so Jody never gave it a chance. But at the time, you know, I was one of the self-proclaimed, uh, you know, sports enthusiasts, you know. I was heavily into every all, all these sports. And all of a sudden, after watching The Secret, they just didn't seem to matter as much anymore. You know, and I, I kind of lost interest in a lot of that stuff. I still do follow professional football, and I play in a couple fantasy football leagues. 
it's fun, but I don't take it anything as seriously as what I used to do in the past. But uh, once again, it ends up coming down to my daughter, Brittany, who, if it wasn't for Brittany, I wouldn't have been there at my ex-wife's house to pick her up. I wouldn't have been introduced to the secret, and the secret is what led me to N5D. What what does what does your daughter think of all this? What does she think of Dad's uh, legacy? What does she think of N5D? What does she think? Does she have any interest in coming on the radio? Is she kind of like, eh? I mean, what is her, what is her take now that she's an adult? What is her take on all these wild, cool, crazy things Dad's done? To her credit, she's open. She listens to everything I say, and uh, whether she agrees with it or not, that's it, it's irrelevant. You know, I, I I encourage her to find her own path to follow her own path, to find out who she is, and whatever that is, I support 100%. Ideally, I would love her to come and be part of N5D, and if and when that day comes, I welcome her with open arms. If that day never comes, I support what she, whatever she does 100%. But uh, she definitely listens. She's got a, a, a serious edge over all of her friends because both of her parents are metaphysical, and she's you know, attended, uh, like, we went. We all went to this um, meeting with uh, Panach Desai, who's a uh, spiritualist, and uh, we all went there, and I remember uh, she was at my townhouse at the time when I was living up in Apollo Beach, and uh, she was on the phone with one of her friends, and she runs outside, and she slams the door, and I, I give her, like, uh, five, ten minutes to chill out, and I go out there to check on her, and she's sitting in the lotus position, meditating on the sidewalk. <laughs> so she gets it, you know. She gets it spiritually. She understands. She's one of those people that I know. I know a handful of people. I have a good friend of mine, Julie, um, who she doesn't necessarily really get into the spirituality aspects like we do, but she's one of those people that just gets it naturally. And uh, you know, Brittany's one of those people too. Wow, you know what? That's wonderful. It's wonderful that she doesn't think you're completely crazy. I know that some, you know, some kids of um, parents that are into the metaphysical world, things like that, they just kind of roll their eyes and really don't want to have anything to do with it. I've got a 13-year-old daughter who's sort of like that, and um, she's just now getting into boys and dating. So uh, that's kind of one of those things. Got any fatherly advice for me on that, Greg? On uh, <laughs> guys coming to court your daughter or call your daughter? I mean, has she ever brought a boyfriend over to meet you or anything like that? Yeah, matter of fact, your, what do you, how do you how do you treat that, that situation? Brittany um, came the last time Brittany visited me here in Florida. She brought her boyfriend with her, and uh, the, the funny thing about her boyfriend is, number one, he's an introvert. <laughs> number two, he's a musician, like just like I am, and uh, there's there's so many things that I see within him that Brittany sees within me. So she's, you know, she, she chose somebody a lot like her father. So my advice to you is to trust her. She's going to go out and she's going to meet some people that you don't like, but she's going to realize that she wants to be with somebody that's going to be a lot like you. Right, right. Have you ever found yourself in situations like that? Maybe when she was growing up you had to bite your tongue a little bit about friends or things like that, you know what I mean, people she was hanging out with? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some people that I saw were potential bad apples that she was hanging out with, but... You know, we all did that. You know, you got to let them learn. They have to I have a, a great story. When Britt was little, she was like maybe two years old, and a friend of mine, Kathy, from upstate New York, when I was still up there, she was over visiting, and uh, every time Britt would look like she's about ready to fall, I'd catch her. She goes, you know, someday Brittany's going to be in her 20s and living out in California or something far away from you. She's going to tell her friends, watch this, and she's going to lean back, and out of nowhere, I'm going to come and scoop her up <laughs> and catch her before she falls. And it's a good lesson to learn because you have to let them fall because they have to know what it's like to pick themselves back up again. Are you there, Larry? Sorry, it froze <laughs> Yeah, I froze there for a second, but I, I heard everything that you had to say, and I totally agree with it, and I'm hoping mine won't make some of the same mistakes I made in my 20s, and I'm sure I'm sure likewise for you, too, but um, as we get into the early 2000s, um, 
what okay I, I understand the meeting that you had or in the, the, the video that you saw at your ex-wife's house but what then okay something had to just spawn you to okay I'm gonna create this website I'm gonna call it in 5d can you remember or talk a little bit about that moment where you decided hey I'm gonna create this and I'm gonna do some videos and I'm just gonna do whatever and help awaken people and and number two, did you think that it would grow to get as big as it has, and it just continues to keep multiplying, really? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and uh, it was a no-brainer for me because, once again, it ties back to the secret, and ultimately my daughter and my ex-wife, you know. But uh, in 2007, I was researching the Internet, and... Uh, I stumbled across all this uh, 2012 bullshit, and the the first thing I, I I thought about was, you know, shit. My my daughter's only going to be uh, 18 or 17 in 2012. You know, it, you know, it's the end of the world. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized it had nothing to do with the end of the world. So I decided I was guided basically to build the website. Uh, Maya12-21-2012.com to show that it's not the end of the world. And I, I created uh, 2012 The Online Movie, which ended up with, I don't know how many millions, 13 million views or something like that on YouTube. And uh, I, I needed to build that, but that wasn't it. That I knew there was a lot more to do. And uh, flash forward to 2008, one of the things that this, The Secret tells you is to ask the universe for ideas and suggestions and direction so I just submitted I said okay you know here I am a child and family therapist I have my own business going and uh, I knew there was more I had to do so I, I, I went outside and I said that's it what is it I need to do and it was that moment that I got what I call a galactic download just flooded with this information at once about what I needed to do what direction I had to go what website I needed to build I was even given the name in 5d at that particular moment in time um, and to answer your second part of your question did I ever think it would get this big hell no <laughs> it, it, it's huge I mean we get between one to three million plus visitors every month and it's honestly I, not one day feels like work I, I love doing what I do I, I work 365 days a year and love every day of it I haven't had a day off since 2008 but to me it's not work so I really haven't worked since 2008 either, so. But I put a lot of hours into it, and uh, I love doing what I do. I really do. It's it's such a it's such a warming feeling, especially like today. I I go to Facebook, and I get this message from a woman that attended our conference here in Sarasota, and she said she was so moved by the presentations, you know, especially you know when she was talk, talking about what I was doing on, on my presentation when I was talking about sigils and intentions and everything and she put it out there and she just got nominated, elected, voted for uh, Miss India <laughs> and then she attributed that to everything that she learned or a lot, a lot of that to what she learned at the conference and I was so happy for her that you know and she's gonna use this as a platform to reach even more people out there, you know, to, to put the spiritual message out there to even more people, and I, I'm just so happy for her, and it's exciting. And when you realize that you can reach people and change people's lives like that, it's a good feeling. There's no amount of money that you can replace that with. This is what it's all about. It's all coming from the heart. That's that, and that makes it all worthwhile. Do you ever have one of those days where maybe you know you're feeling a little bit down or sour or whatever, and then you'll get a message from somebody talking about how you know they stumbled across your site and it just really changed their life? I mean, it's it's got to be amazing, and it must never get old to um, to experience that feeling. And also, I wanted to ask. I know I've talked to you about this before, but who were some of your influence? I know you um, you mentioned the zany mystic Lance White, who's really entertaining his fireside chats to listen to. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, he was. And how? Okay, how did it come about where you were able to say get in contact back in those days with somebody like a Dolores Cannon or George Norrie or some of these other people that you had, you know that you have interviewed on your show? Uh, 
Um, and that could, must have been quite exciting. I'm just wondering how it is that, you know, must have been part of that galactic download. How did you get in contact with some of these people? Well, um, some of my influences, definitely. I mean, uh, I, I grew up listening to every, everyone that everyone else has been listening to. You know, um, I, I listened a lot to uh, Dolores Cannon, loved her material. All of the convoluted universe material is <laughs> above and beyond. It just, like she says, it bends your mind like a pretzel. Um, I love that stuff. Uh, Will, David Wilcock, um, I, you know, a lot of his material I, I found very interesting when I first started my awakening. Um, I loved uh, the material that John Major Jenkins was putting out about 2012 because he wasn't fear mongering this and he wasn't he was shooting from the heart and uh, you know he was basically saying that it's going to be another day it's it's but as we know it's more than that you know something magical did happen even though people will say oh nothing happened oh well there was a great awakening that happened because of it you know <laughs> a lot of us did get into spirituality as a result of that um, as for uh, getting some of these people on um, I had a um, my co-host at the time was uh, Heidi Cole, the, uh, my first radio co-host, and she's the one that contacted Dolores Cannon. And because M5D is is such a big name, we can get all the big names that are out there. Well, most of them, I guess. I, I, you know, who who knows? I haven't tried everyone, but I, I'd imagine most people would want to be on M5D because we have such a huge platform, and uh, we've gotten on some amazing people, um, whether it's on N5D radio or at our conferences. We have a conference coming up in October. It's a, you know, a lot of psychic um, people are going to be a psychic conference and we're going to be talking about the future. And uh, there's some really exciting things that are going to be happening. And uh, I don't know if I should get into it right now because I haven't officially put the video out and made it yet. But, um, oh man. Well, that, that's something. That's something you'll definitely have to think about. Do you have like a? It brought a mind a que brought a question to my mind. Do you have like a bucket list, maybe, of a couple people you'd like to interview that you haven't before it's all said and done? Maybe like David Ike. Maybe like I know you've tried Barbara Marciniak. Almost had her. That would be a really big score because she really doesn't do a lot of that sort of thing or come on Facebook. But is there anybody that? And by the way, you mentioned David Wilcock, one of my great influences too. And a lot of people will look at David and think that he's um, new on the scene or he looks so young. But David's been around for, I mean, I think I heard him on Art Bell in the late 90s, a young David Wilcox. So he's been around a while. But is there anybody like on your bucket list you might want to interview, like a David Icke or a Barbara Marciniak or somebody that maybe Eric Von Donneken? I was actually contacted um, by David Icke's um, press team to interview him. And I, I, I turned it down. <laughs> um well, you know, I, I, I'm pretty much done with the interviewing thing. Um, there's more important things for me to do, and I, I appreciate everybody that I, I have had the opportunity to interview, but i got to move forward, and um, a lot of this stuff is coming from within, so I'm, I'm getting a lot of my own material here and putting that out there. And one, one of the things I was alluding to earlier is a dream that I had and I'm going to be making a video and an article about this, and I'm going to be expounding on this at the conference, but I had a dream where there are three tidal waves that are coming. And in this dream, I'm on the beach, and I'm looking out at, at the ocean, and I see this huge tidal wave coming my way. And I turn around, and I look behind me in the opposite direction, and there's a, another tidal wave that's ten times bigger than the one I saw in front of me. So I run into this beach house and uh, the waves converge and they go over and uh, while I'm in there and apparently the beach house is underwater, I could stick my hand through the window and feel the water and pull it back out. And I was safe, I wasn't scared. So the water reside, uh, um, it, it, the water um, goes back and everything's fine and I get out of the beach house and I look up over the mountain behind me again. There's another tidal wave coming up over the mountain. So I go back into the beach house. The water goes over me, comes back again. And uh, I realized at that point my truck, which I've never owned a truck, but in the dream I had a truck. My truck was up on the mountain. So I go up to the mountain to look for it. And there's people walking around up there, and everything's really cool. And it just had a completely different 
really peaceful energy going on. So what I see that that dream is is water is a mutable energy, which means you know it can be ice, it can be water, gas, vapor, liquid, whatever. It wasn't a wave that I saw. It was a wave of energy. So what, what's going to happen here sometime in the near future? We're going to know about some wave that's coming in, whether it's, what's that, Paul Lavaliette, he was talking about um, some galactic wave, super wave. We're going to be focused on that, but there's something much, much, much bigger coming from the other direction. And when they converge, something magical is going to happen. Not only that, there's a cleansing wave that will, of, of, of energy. Maybe at that point, when the, those first two converge, a lot of people will make that transition, whatever that might be. But that last wave will be the cleansing one, so it will give other people an opportunity to also make that transition. Does that make sense? Amazingly, yeah, amazingly makes sense. And uh, the question that was formulated in my mind the whole time that you're describing this is, um, the, the interpretation of dreams, what what do you attribute to being able to interpret dreams like you do and do you have any advice for people that you know may have some kind of a dream like that and they may just take it as oh we're gonna have a tidal wave and it's gonna flood the coast and it's gonna be the end of the world and all that but perhaps it means something different I mean what do you attribute your ability to be able to interpret it and take a stack outside of the box and you know look at it from all angles and if you had any advice for other people to you know what what to do when they're just sitting on a dream like that yeah, um, it's a really good question. As I mentioned, in college I was a uh, psychology major and one of the classes I took was the psychology of sleep and dreams with uh, Dr. Rainville and it was one of the best classes I ever took. Now what I found at the collegiate level is that when you're learning about sleep and dreams, they're not going to teach you dream analysis on a metaphysical level. Here's a great example. I had a dream one time where I was in the foundation of a house and uh, it was just like concrete blocks being built around and there were three ladders uh, going up all right next to each other and I was straddling the two outside ladders and I was on the top of the ladder just kind of like standing there looking around see what's going on. And that's all I remember of the dream but in the psychology of sleep and dreams. What you learn is, if you see a house, if you see a house, if you see a car, that house, that car, is you. A lot of times we'll see, a, we'll be in a car and we can't control it. There's something in our lives that are out of control. Now in this house, this was the foundation of something big that was being built. There were three ladders in there. Now in typical a dream analysis they say you know if you're climbing a ladder you're gonna get a promotion or you're gonna get a raise something along that line but what they don't teach you is the metaphysical aspects of what a ladder means when you look at a ladder that's a strand of DNA each ladder is a strand of DNA so we had three of them that's three strands of DNA I'm at the top of this and this is like a message for humanity this is where we're heading this is the direction where we're going a DNA upgrade the house is being built for the new human to live in. So it was a wonderful dream. And um, you have to start looking at things more metaphysically. Now, on N5D, I wrote an article of the top 40 um, dream symbols. And you can find that. Just type in 40 dream symbols in the upper right hand search bar on N5D. And I do include the metaphysical meanings of what dreams will be in there, too. So um, try to look at the, the dreams metaphysically. Don't necessarily see them. For example, I, I was at the beach with one of my beach buddies and uh, his name's Kenny. He's not, he's not metaphysical or spiritual. He's just a good guy. You know, re really good heart. But he also had that uh, same dream about the, the tidal wave. It was just one in his dream. And he, it went over him and he was underwater and he could breathe and he said there wasn't, he wasn't scared at all. It just felt normal. It's kind of like when you're flying. You have those dreams of flying and you can swoop down and you know, I've had that dream multiple times where I can fly I'm petrified of heights in the in the in their 3D reality, but in my dreams, I, it's like I can do this. I, I've been doing this all my life, forever. I've been flying forever, and you can swoop down and arch up and go as high as you want, and you're not afraid of the heights. So uh, 
yeah, my friend Kenny had that dream, and uh, you know, he's underwater, and he felt like it was natural, just like the flying dream. It feels like you're natural. So um, understand what the feeling is behind that. If you see something that's potentially scary, and you're not scared, there's probably a much, much deeper meaning behind that of what that actually means. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think a lot of us have blocked out having dreams like that because we are scared of flying. I know, you know, I had them until I was six years old and then stopped having dreams like that. The spiral one's very interesting. It, it's really kudos to you for um, not being scared of those dreams. You know, some people get to astral traveling and they feel like it's flying too fast and they don't, they don't <laughs> like it. I mean, would you consider the dream? Would you consider yourself to be? Do you do you astral project in the stereotypical sense of it? Those dreams kind of sound like it, but you know they might have just been really vivid dreams. Do you yourself now practice astral traveling? No, no, I don't. I came really close one time, and it was a lesson that I learned. Um, I was as I was lifting out of my body, my cell phone rang. I forgot to shut off my cell phone, and I haven't tried since. But to me, I, I have a feeling that you know most of the time when, when we dream, that's when I get a lot of messages. I also get visions too. Um, when I right before I go to go to bed, I, I'll get visions that come in when when my mind goes into the alpha state. So I'm still cognizant. I'm still aware of what's happening. Like for example, this one vision I got, and it might be tied into the three waves, is that I saw a person. I don't know if it was me or if it, or if it was somebody else. It was in front of me. And then all of a sudden, this white light comes and encompasses that person. And all you could feel, all I could feel through that person was complete, unconditional love that's going on. And so to me, there's something, maybe those, those are those two waves that when they converge, that's what's going to happen. So you know, I, I get visions like that on top of the dreams that I have, and I tie everything together. There's a, a girl that um, is a big supporter of N5D. Her name is Lisa. BPG, we'll call her, um, and uh, her and I, she dream travels. She's a dream walker, and she, she, we, we've had multiple dreams that are the same, and uh, we, we exchange our dreams to each other um, on the internet, and then when we meet face-to-face, -face, we talk about them too, but uh, that's what some of, some of us do too, is we travel throughout other people's dreams, and uh, that's why it's kind of important. I was told by several people that I need to get my face out there and as being being an introvert I don't like doing that but I know that there's something maybe it's the something within the codons in, in somebody the facial recognition the the familiarity of maybe seeing me I don't know what it is and I can't explain why but and to me I, I don't personally like being out in the public but uh, I was told that I needed to do that and that's why we're I'm doing the video part right now as much as an introvert as I am, it's it's not easy to do, as you know. Yeah, it's not being an introvert myself. It's kind of hard, but you figure, you know, we're at this phase right now where it's it's something that you were called to do, and certainly everything that you described in your life has led up to this. So I mean, it's pretty undeniable. And you were mentioning being a psychology major and them not addressing the metaphysical aspect of these dreams. I think that just points out a big flaw in our educational system, no matter what level it's at to boot, because you you know there's so many things that are not included in these teachings and in this analysis. And I mean, by the time by the time you were old enough and got into that um, class per se back then, were you at the point where you were just kind of like, okay, well, I'm not, you know, I'll question this stuff inside, but I'm not going to question the teachers like I did my Sunday school teachers. Or is this something that you tried to bring into the awareness? Do you remember of your of your teacher, and also, um, would you recommend writing down these dreams the first thing you wake up in the morning? Would you recommend um, recording your thoughts on on something like that? That's a lot of questions, right there, Larry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually I tried to just make it two, man. One was just, would you recommend writing them down or recording your dreams? And two, did you um, did you bother with even trying to um, explain the metaphysical aspect to your teacher? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I tried contacting my teacher about that, and I talked to him about a particular dream, and I don't remember what dream it was, <clears throat> but I was talking about the metaphysical aspects of it, 
And uh, and I honestly don't remember his answer, but I did contact him one time after I graduated, and he has since passed on. But he was such a a, a wonderful man. He was blind. Um, he was what they call advantageously blind, which means he had vision up till you know a early teenager, and then something happened where he lost his vision. And what I found fascinating about this, as he told us in class, is that he would go to these conventions uh, for the blind and they would segregate themselves. The advantageously blind would all be in one little corner and uh, those who were uh, blind from birth would be in another corner. So, Because they had like the advantageously blind have a, a slight advantage, so to speak, of knowing what an orange looks like, knowing what a tree looks like, what a blue jay looks like, you know? Um, so, also, he, I, I, I remember asking him, as you got older, were your dreams more visual or were they more tactile, uh, other senses? And he said, at first, I would dream about, you know, normal dreams like everyone else, but as, you know, time progressed, it would be more sensory other than the eyes. So it, it was really fascinating. I learned so much from him, and you know, I hope he's doing well on the other side um, of the veil. Um, what was the uh, second question, Larry? Uh, the second one was about right. You know, when you have these dreams, um, would you recommend that people? You know, the first thing that they can do when they get up, would you recommend them recording these dreams, write them down, doing them on voice mm -hmm. audio or whatever, just so they're still fresh in their mind because we have a tendency usually to forget a lot of dreams we have I mean unless they're really wild ones like the, like the ones you're mentioning but typically even if they're good dreams that mean something we may forget them so I was just wondering what you thought about documenting them definitely um, I do that I have a dream journal that I keep um, matter of fact here's a here's a great one I had um, when my ex and I got divorced and we, we all moved down here to Florida and uh at the time I was married to wife number two and Amy was married to her current husband right now, David, wonderful guy. And uh, we all moved to Florida and then at one point Amy decided she's going to move back to New York and she didn't tell me about it and all of a sudden I, you know, I, I hear, well, we're moving back to New York in two weeks. I'm like, what? Anyway, um, they ended up going back to New York and I, I knew I, I wanted to get up there at some point to be with my daughter. And uh, so a friend of mine contacted me, and this was after I had a dream. i got to tell the dream first. I had a dream where I was in New York, and honestly, 90% of my dreams, I'm back in New York. I'm back home in upstate New York. Back home. That's the message. Like the wave, it's, 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 it has to be interpreted in a different way. I'm not in New York. I'm back home. Back home wherever that might be. It might be Lyra, it might be the Pleiades, it could be anywhere. It could just be on the other side of the veil. But 90% of my dreams, I'm back home in upstate New York, but wherever that might be. So I had this I had this dream where I was in upstate New York and I was with my daughter visiting my friend Kathy and we're leaving her place. She was in a townhouse or something. We're leaving her place, going out to my car, and my car was wrapped up in an it was there was like a big eggshell around my car, an Easter eggshell like. And I'm like, that's really strange. And I wrote that dream down and I put it put that in my dream journal. And about a week or two later, a buddy of mine calls me up. He goes, Hey Greg, I heard that you're a great bartender. Can I'm opening up a bar here in Oneonta. Would you like to bartend for me? I'm like, sure. I'll be up uh, as soon as I can. So I pack all my stuff up. I dissolve my business so I could be with my daughter. And I pack all my stuff up, go uh, move up to New York. The first thing I'm going to do, obviously, when I go to New York is visit my daughter. So I go to her mom's house, and I, I see my daughter, and I give her this big bear hug. And as I'm hugging her, I realize today is Easter Sunday. And what I, dream what I dreamed about was that I would be with my daughter on Easter Sunday. And I had no idea at that point when I had that dream that that's what it meant. So that's why it's important that you write these dreams down because they're going to come around and some point at some point they're going to make sense to you. Wow, that, that does make a lot of sense. That's fascinating. And as far as your professor goes, what was coming to my mind, and I think you answered the question, um, I was thinking 
you know, because he had that vision up until his teens. I wonder as time goes by if you forget what an orange looks like. Like, I mean, say by the time he got into his 30s or 40s, I've always wondered if people that are visually impaired of that nature, if they forget. And I think you kind of answered that maybe in the dream. But did you ever have a chance to ask him if he remembered what an orange looked like still or, you know, what, what anything? I wish I did. Like? I wish I did. I, I, I never had that opportunity. He was such a good man. Wow. And he had a, uh, a, an assistant there because he was blind. Obviously, anyone could cheat on the test if they wanted to. So there was an assistant there that would make sure none of us were cheating. And uh, the reason I had him, I had him for three different classes. And the reason I had him for so many classes was that he was one of the most difficult um, professors that everyone would say, oh, he's really hard, really hard. Um, and I knew that if I want to do anything in psychology, I better learn how to um, understand his classes the best I can because, um, excuse me, i got to bring the computer inside, the battery's low. Uh, because, uh, you know, if I know my material, then it's going to make me a better therapist in the end. So that's that's why I did what I did and why I took him He sounds like one of yeah, he sounds like one of those gentlemen that come into our lives that really make a difference. I would say that whether he knew it or not, he was definitely a light worker, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, a true blessing to have him for a teacher for uh, three different classes. I had him for personality theory, uh, the psychology of sleep and dreams, and abnormal psychology. It's wonderful. <laughs> Sounds like you, you you got the you got the full download from him as you're perusing through the uh, N5D uh, state there, um, Greg. You know we were talking earlier on a pre-show, and you really put this into perspective for me. We were talking, you know, I was just asking you what you thought about this ele the election and all these shenanigans going on and this kind of transparency clearing theater that's going on in front of us. And yeah, I just like to get your opinion on air, like you did before. What? What, what do you think, just what in the hell do you think's going on here with this stuff, Greg Prescott? <laughs> well, uh, who knows? Um, that's it. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> hell if I know. Um, what's going to happen? Um, there's, I was listening to um, Greg Hunter, and he was interviewing Bill Holder. Um, Holden, Holton, Holder, one of those people. Holton, I, I believe it was, and uh, he was talking about how there's, he believes that there's less than a 50% chance of there actually being an election this year because the silver and gold markets um, have been, as, as Deutsche Bank has admitted to, they've been corrupted for a long time, and uh, what we're going to see is, um, you know, in the, here in the United States, we're not going to know, you know, at least through the mainstream media, What's what's going on until it's it's all done and said? But um, obviously, on April 18th, China went to a gold-backed currency, and of course, here in the United States, they're making us seem like you know everything's fine, that the dollar's still worth something, which it's not. It's just fiat currency that's been printed uh, way beyond its means, and uh, it's it's worth nothing. I mean, if you think about it, how much does it cost to print a one-dollar bill? How much does it cost to print a $100 bill? What's basically the difference other than the ink that it's printed on? The value that we establish for it, the per perceived value. So what I see happening, um, and there's several other people that see this as a possibility, and I, I think that what we need to do is be prepared um, in ways that, um, for example, um, make sure that you have water and food supplies because if the dollar dies it, there's going to be chaos that's going on here um, so make sure you have enough food and water supplies um, to help others if you have the opportunity to to do that you know um, make that possible help try to try to help others make sure that you um, have enough for yourself try to make sure you have an, a little extra for other people as well um, it could get a little rough. From what I understand, though, there already is another gold-backed currency that is ready to be put in place. But what we have to do is wait that time period. And who knows? It might be two weeks. It might be uh, two months. 
And in the meanwhile, it's there's the potential for a lot of people to not be in a very good position. And uh, we could lose a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, and this is something that could have all been prevented um, if you know there was no such thing as money, obviously. Um, but I, I see that it's going to be good in the, in the long run. We're going to make a transition eventually into a gold-backed currency, but that's not the answer. Eventually, we need to get out of money completely, along with uh, getting out of government. Uh, the money and government and religion, they've all held us back through subservience, control, and conformity, and it's time to move past that. And in order to be a type 1 civilization, we're not even a type 1 yet, but in order to be that, we have to move beyond that. And I've, I've, I've always said that. You know, if a UFO were to land in your backyard, there's two things that the the extraterrestrial wouldn't have: money and a Bible. So we got to move beyond that. And uh, so yeah, be safe. You have that. said that. You you have said that. I've heard you say that on numerous occasions, by the way. But it is true. Yeah. So, you know, I I I would like to think that before that happens, maybe our galactic friends and neighbors would come in and help us. I put that out there that, you know, hey, pick me up anytime you're ready. <laughs> um, I don't want to see anyone. Yeah, I put, no, I put that intention out there too, Greg. And you know what? I got to thinking when you were just going through that or in the pre-show when you mentioned that to me, I was thinking about the money system as it is. When you think back to when, you know, bartering was the way to go between your neighbor, you know, you bartered with them. But then I think about the way cash came into play as trying to play it off as a barter system, but really it was just a complete control system. And I think now the consciousness is rising to the point where we can just about handle, get going towards the cashless society as well as no government per se and go, bridging that gap to become a type 1 civilization and quit being stuck on point seven or point six wherever wherever we're at. But do you, you, do you see this, if the shit hits a fan like this, do you see do you see the mass chaos? Do you see it spreading quickly? I mean, like even to small town America and not being able to maybe, you know, buy something at your grocery store real quick. Maybe their ATM machines. Well, of course, if money's no good anyway. That's just a rambling thought I had. And also, I wanted to make it clear that um, because I know that you're not a big fan of this, and I really am not either. That what you're talking about is definitely not Nasara. No, and it's not. Um, uh, what's that other thing? Uh, Indy. That indie bank thing? Uh, I've barely heard of it. I, I don't know. I just know that I've had Sara ram down my throat now for about, oh, five or six years. And, you know, it's just I don't like putting a label on something like that. It sounds and, you know, to keep talking about it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. I just, you know, it's kind of it kind of wears thin on me, man, you know. Yeah, yeah, and God, they've been talking about Nassar since the 1990s, and there's always these packets that are supposed to be delivered, and something comes up, and they didn't get delivered, but next week it's going to happen, or somewhere down the future it's going to happen, but it's never today. Um, I, yeah, I, I think Nassar is hot air and bullshit. Um, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's not the answer anyway. We need to move beyond uh, money, government, and religion, and I, I have a video out there called Global Unity Project, what the world needs right now. And I've encouraged people to copy it and put that on their YouTube channels and share it with everybody um, far and wide because it presents what's wrong and gives solutions and encourages everyone to be part of the solution to come together, Global, Un Global Unity Project, to come together and uh, put these solutions into one cohesive unit where we can all move beyond money, government, religion, and uh, subservience, control, and conformity. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's like I look at something like, just to wrap it up about Nassar, I look at something like that where you keep talking and keep talking. And even if it's something that's in the works at this point, you know what? It's like shut up about it until it really happens. And I agree it's definitely not the answer. And I would encourage everybody to check out check out the video that, you, that you're speaking of because with Nasara or with anything, read into it. Don't just get hung up on a label. People get hung up on a label so easy and they just want somebody to take care of all their worries and while wow, this is going to happen, you know, on this portal date, the extraterrestrials are going to land and whatnot and, you know, really do some thinking and dig into it. And that's what I like about your articles and videos is they're insightful. They explain this, they explain that, they don't just make a bunch of false promises. 
you know, they do give innate possibilities, and I really appreciate all the work you've done as far as that goes, but, you know, I would encourage people out there to use discernment in what you're reading, and if it's something you've seen around for years and years, geez, I didn't know Greg, and this art has been around since the 90s, so I can imagine your frustration with it, and, you know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of, fall, you know, well, yeah, I'm not trying to date Greg Prescott here, but, you know, he, he remembers back in the 90s, so do oh, yeah. I, but... Yep. But it just, you know what I mean, it just gets old to see it time and time again, and, you know, people really need to do some thinking for their own and, you know, use things that resonate with them. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I guess it's just one of them things, and we'll see how it goes, but wh where do you, do you like, you know, I know you sometimes you, you, you target the number, you target the year 2023, and 23 to me is, Everybody sees 1111. I see all that too, but I see 23 everywhere I go, and that's why, for some reason, it really represents, it really resonates with me, you know, your theory on a lot of this coming together in, in 2023. Yeah. Um, and I guess I should talk a little about Pluto and Capricorn. Uh, Pluto, yes. en yeah, Pluto entered Capricorn in 2008, and right on schedule, we saw the collapse of. Uh, the banking system, except with the exception of the two big to fail slash jail banks, we saw hundreds of banks collapse here in the United States, and that was not a coincidence. That's immediately when Pluto entered Capricorn. Pluto is known as the destroyer, and it tears down everything that's not in humanity's best interests. So what we're going to see is a continued collapse as we move through Pluto through Capricorn. Uh, continued collapse of money, government, and religion. Pluto exits Capricorn in 2023, and already we've seen the corruption of the church, governments, we've seen money currencies die. It's all happening right on schedule, and it's so predictable. And people that say, oh, well, that's astrology, that's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, you know, those who don't learn from the cycles of time are doomed to repeat it. Those who don't le learn from history are do doomed to repeat it. And this is what happens with astrology. These cycles come around, and they come around, and the same thing happens over and over again. What have we learned? What are we going to do about it? And that's where we're at right now. We have an opportunity here to change everything. We can make next year seem, seem like something out of the space age. It'll make today seem like the Stone Age with all this technology that can get released if we, if we made it happen. And there's ways of making it happen. But it all starts with awareness. For example, Del Monte just announced that they're no longer going to be using GMOs. How did that happen? Through awareness. And we're, we're doing the same thing with chemtrails, which was one of the biggest searched terms on Google recently. Uh, people are, are looking into that, you know, especially with the, uh, like the article I put out on N5D uh, last week about those black chemtrails that we're starting to see now. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a series called uh, Slow Kill um, on, on YouTube where I'm exposing how our food, water, and air supplies are all being poisoned. Um, and this is stuff that any of us can do. And is, the more that we put it out there, the more awareness we create, the more we can change this paradigm. Um, some people will say, well, you're focusing on you know, GMOs, and that's going to bring more in. No, that's not what happened. If you look at what happened, yeah, we're focusing on it, but what's what's happening is we're showing that people don't want that. That's what we're focusing on. We don't want GMOs, and that's coming around right now where you're starting to see, um, like I said, Del Monte um, is is going moving away from GMOs. You're seeing on packaging right now, um, a lot of the packaging is saying no high fructose corn syrup on the package, and as you know that uh, the GMO corn has what's called a BT toxin built into the corn where the bugs eat it and they implode from the inside. So what's going to happen is, you know, they take that same corn, they make high fructose corn syrup, and now you're seeing all these people having digestive problems, leaky gut syndrome and stuff like that, uh, glyphosate poisoning, which I believe my sister is going through right now. She's having issues with her kidney and her, her, her liver, and I believe that's through uh, the glyphosate that's being sprayed on the foods, and I told her to get tested for that. Um, ASAP to make sure that that's so we can rule that out or see if that is the cause. Um, but it's it's all, all boils down to awareness. Get out there and talk to people. You know, petition whatever you can do. Just put pictures up on in uh, on, on on your Facebook page 
that show awareness. Um, share articles. Um, that, that, that We have a ton of articles on N5D on bodymindsoulspirit.com that you can share with um, your, your, your friends and family on, on social networking that just create awareness. And uh, more than anything, stay positive, stay grounded. Each, each day I, uh, I go for a three-mile walk on the beach. I try, I, and honestly, I, I tell people this, I have to force myself to go to the beach, otherwise I'll stay here and I'll work 20 hours <laughs> you know, instead of 15. But I force myself to go to the beach. And uh, I, I take a three-mile walk, and I do. I, I, of course, I, I do that barefoot. And you're getting so many benefits from walking barefooted. Your your feet are absorbing the uh, electrons through the ground when you're barefooted. Plus, when you walk by the beach, when the ra when the waves crash on the beach, they create negative ions, which are the reason why you feel so good when you go to the beach. You, you're you're breathing in those those negative ions. And that's that's a feel good. Those those are 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 a really good thing. So you got the, the the electrons and the positive ions and or the negative ions and it's just a beautiful thing. I also do uh, what I call a walk of gratitude and uh, love bubble meditation on there. So while I'm at the beach, I'm also doing my light work uh, stuff there. And I envision that everybody on the beach is family. It's one big family reunion. When you look at people like that at the beach and you realize that. This is just one big family. You're looking at them with a completely different energy instead of this guy's a stranger and that person might be a lunatic. I don't like what that person's wearing. Who cares when they're all family, you know? So when you when you do that, it changes the energy that you're putting out there. And when I do that, I ask creator, source, universe, spirit guides, guardian angels, friends and family on both sides of the veil, my higher self and Mother Earth to join me and to take that energy from our heart center to extend it out as far as you can throughout the planet, galaxy, universe, and multiverse and to send loving, healing energy to everyone. So it's not just a walk, it's more than that. And you, anyone can do this. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I don't like to go around and give myself a pat on the back for anything because there's so much work I have to do. You know, when it's all said and done, I'd like to look back eventually and say, you know what, I did everything I could do. But until then, I've got so much more work I, I have to do. and. Uh, I think this is something that anyone can do, that the walk of gratitude where you just stop and give thanks to everyone I just named. I call them my posse, uh, you know, creator, source, universe, spirit guides, garden angels, friends and family on both sides of the veil, right down the line. Just give gratitude um, and thank them for, you know, protection, safety, abundance, and everything that's good in life. Um, and just go right down. And basically, it's ho'opono, ho'opono. Um, and you, you're giving that, that you know, you, thank you, uh, please forgive me, I'm sorry, I love you, you know. Go right down and thank them all and tell them everything that you're saying from the heart and you'll see that your, your world will change around you. Everything starts changing for the positive. And you can look at these events like this event that's going to be coming up when the dollar crashes. You look at it completely differently when you're looking at it from the heart. Uh, anything that happens in this world, you're looking at completely differently when it all comes from the heart. So stay in the heart as much as you can, and uh, everything will be okay. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And, you know, as far as raising awareness goes, you know, it's like I tell people, you don't have to go out and organize a big rally and a big protest. You can have a conversation. You can post something on Facebook. You can just, you know, infer to it to somebody. But two things real quick that came up. Okay, as far as the chemtrails go, I think... Well, in my opinion at least, and I don't know what you think, I think that there's always multiple reasons why they do the things they do. So I think that there's multiple reasons for these chemtrails, not just poisoning our – well, they're poisoning the hell out of our ecosystem. But what – you know, there's multiple reasons why they're doing this, whether it's human experimenting as well. But you mentioned a friend of yours um, that had to go to the doctor. Now, whether it's sickness from some of these related issues, GMO chemtrails, or whether they're ascension symptoms just in general, I mean, do you see at some point a group of doctors or some doctors going, well, scratching their head and going, what the hell is wrong with some of these people? We're getting multiple cases of people coming in for this or that. Or, I mean, do you ever see any of these doctors scratching their head and realizing that it's something bigger than just what th their diagnosis from medical school and what they learned from there may be? I mean, do you, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, the problem is, is that, you know, if you trace the history of Big Pharma, you'll find that Rockefeller is at the bottom of, of that. You go all the way down to the bottom. The Rockefellers were the ones that created the medical colleges. 
that backed big pharma. You know, and as far as big pharma is concerned, they don't want a cure for anything because they all they want is repeat business. You know, I, I know that when I had a, a stage three cancer in uh, 2007, they have to offer either surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy before they can do any kind of holistic thing. And that's ass backwards because it should be the other way around. You should do something holistically and as a last resort measure, do something that they're doing right now. But it's all been corrupted for such a long time that you know who knows what the right thing to do is. If you're going to ask a doctor about glyphosate poisoning, they're not trained in that area. They have no clue of what they're looking for when it comes to that. So when they did my sister's blood tests, I guarantee they didn't test for that, but I, I would like them to do another run on that test and specifically test for that in her system. So you, know, you, you would have to go to a holistic doctor for them to even have an idea of what that might possibly be outside of what the medical industry is telling them what it could possibly be. Yeah, so you're completely trapped with, with inside the box going to a medical doctor because they're bound by so many decades and centuries of big pharma, you know, the, yes. the what I call the dope industry, one of the big three that controls the planet. And so it, it's just wild. And one other thing I wanted to ask you about, because you'd mentioned this before, like talking about getting rid of government. Um, you were talking one time about a council of elders that you wouldn't even mind sitting on. Would you think that something like that could, I don't, want to use the word government to replace a government, but I don't know. I mean, would, would you recommend uh, us going to something like that and maybe a council oh, of yeah. elders instead of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was in, that, that's one of the uh, suggestions I have on uh, that video, Global Unity Project, what the world needs right now is a council of elders where they're 100% transparent and uh, they, they you can vote on them every week if you wanted to, every day if you wanted to. Um, and each week they'd have to say, okay, what did this is what we did in humanity's best interest. And once they stop working in humanity's best interest, they're fired. There's no two-year or four-year term limit. You know, they, you're either working for humanity or you're out of here. Okay, so I would volunteer for that job in a heartbeat, and, and hopefully that you know somebody would be able to run in 5D for me <laughs> while I'm working in humanity's best interest on a much larger level, but. I would love to do that, and actually, I'd love to do both if I still could. If I could find a way to do both of them, still run in 5D and be in one of the elders that works in humanity says in best interest, I would volunteer for that in a heartbeat. That's the answer. Piece of cake, government. man. Yeah, government's <laughs> not the answer. And, and term limits and vote the way the voting system is, you know, these super delegates that we have here in the states is a bunch of BS. It's it's all gotta it's all gotta collapse in order for us to move forward, and it will and we will. Yeah, it really is, and we will, and it really is ridiculous for the super delegates. It's like, okay, Greg, I'm gonna I'll take you, I'll I'll let you vote, but I'm gonna go ahead and make the decision. And if your vote coincides with what I like, well, then it counts. But if it don't, well, then it don't. That's your luck. That's our privilege because we are the super delegates. Yeah, that that shit needs to be getting rid of, and you know these term limits and just the whole system of the way we do things is so broke down and up is down and black is white. And you're right, the holistic measures though they wouldn't that, wouldn't that make a whole hell of a lot of sense that you exhausted all those options first and the natural yeah. homeopathic yeah. treatments before going into this crap. I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. And hopefully by spreading awareness, um. You know, I really appreciate pioneers like yourself for bringing this into our awareness and having a great tool like in 5D. And there's, you, you could go in there and search anything. I mean, I can't think of many things that you could go in there and just randomly type in your search engine, and you're going to find something on anything that you want to know. If you're just awakened and you want to delve into the research, yes, you've got Google and YouTube, but in 5D is right there, and I guarantee you that it, as it pertains to the metaphysical world, extraterrestrials are awakening. I mean, you're going to find not just one thing. You're going to find a plethora of articles or videos there, and I really appreciate it, man. And on that note, was there is there anything else that you wanted to say to the say to the peeps out there before we wrap it up? No, just sending love to everyone, and uh, stay in your heart, be positive, help others. And that's that's basically it. Absolutely. Okay, well, Mr. Prescott, where can people find you on the wonderful, I know you've went over this, but on the wonderful world of the web, where are some places they could find Greg Prescott if they're interested in your work? 
Yeah, well, obviously, in5d.com, uh, body, mind, soul, spirit.com. Uh, our YouTube channel, just type in in5d and subscribe to our videos there. And uh, you can find us on Facebook. Um, there's an in5d Facebook page where we have got 400,000 people following. I think we have over 110,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So we're, we're reaching, reaching a lot of people in all sorts of different formats, and that's what it's all about. You know, how many people can we reach? How many more can we reach? How many more can we help until we finally make this transition from where we are to, to our next stage of spiritual progression? Well, there you <laughs> well, there you have the words from the great Greg Prescott exactly. And I'd like to echo those sentiments. And real quick, as far as if you want to find my little corner of the world, um, you can find me at larrylockin.wix.com forward slash Pleiadian Express Pro.com. You can go check out that website. Um, we do take donations. Um, you can take a look at all our channels through there, Pleiadian Light Grid Project and Pleiadian Express Productions. I'll just make it real simple for everybody. You can see all of the ventures I have on one page at Pleiadian um, Groups and Pages page on Facebook. That'll run you down the list. And Greg, thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to wish everybody namaste and give everybody a big dating game kiss. And we're out. Mwah. Namaste, all. <laughs>